privately, preparing himself for the study of the Word of God using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Now, thank you, loving Father, for your matchless grace, which we shall continue to study. May God the Holy Spirit help us to, be, to stand in awe of the grace which is ours, not only to save us, to keep us, but also to cause us to live and to be victorious throughout all of our lives, and then to take us into eternity future in which you can bless us there to the maximum. Thank you for your grace again. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have, been, we have noted now that every member of the human race comes to the point of God consciousness someplace in his life. But because he is spiritually brain dead, spiritually dead, and under the principle of total depravity, there is no way that this person can ever in any way understand spiritual phenomena. It just cannot be done. It doesn't make any difference if he's a genius or if he is one uh, step above a moron. He cannot understand those things. What he can understand at a God consciousness is the fact that there is a supreme being and secondly, that this supreme being has fantastic power. Now, at this time, he exercises his free will and volition either to desire a relationship with this God or, or the supreme being, or not to. If, if he goes on negative volition, at the point of God consciousness, God is no longer obligated to give him any further information. This person, now God is, has discharged his absolute righteousness and justice by making it possible for this person to understand this much. And if he rejects it, he need receive no more information. On the other hand, if he goes on positive volition, then God is responsible to give him the second bit of information, which is called gospel hearing. But because he is spiritually dead, spiritually brain dead and in, in total depravity, he could not understand the gospel because he is called a soulish man. He has only a soul and a body. He's dichotomous. He does not have a human spirit, which makes it possible for him to understand spiritual things. Therefore, God, in his matchless grace, uh, does what is called the doctrine of common grace. Under the doctrine of common grace, God the Holy Spirit makes the gospel clear inside the soul of this person. Now, this person must use his volition, first of all, to decide to listen to the gospel. That's a decision which he himself must make. He must make the decision to listen to what is told to him, whether it's in a group, by a pastor, or by reading, or whatever it may be. And then secondly, he will have to respond to the message uh, by the same volition. But he, his decision to listen uh, makes it possible for the Holy Spirit to make clear the a gospel in his uh, soul so that he can function at the second point uh, of uh, the, the decision to be made on the message. Now, at the same time that God the Holy Spirit issues the, uh, makes it clear, he also issues what is called calling grace, the calling grace invitation. And that is an invitation to this person to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as his own personal Savior. Uh, this, is, uh, this calling grace is first seen in uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, where the Bible says, My spirit shall not always strive with a man. The word strive is the word dun, D-U-N, pronounced uh, with the long U, the D-U-M, and it means to, to, uh, uh, the, 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 judi the Holy Spirit brings a judicial charge 
uh, and uh, makes clear uh, the in the warning that is given. Uh, this is the whole principle of common grace, followed by calling grace, so that he was issuing for 120 years uh, under the ministry of Noah the invitation. And uh, uh, then uh, we saw it also in the words which uh, are used by the Lord Jesus Christ that no man comes to God unless the Father draw him. That's calling grace. That's inviting grace. Now, even then, you must remember that here's a person who has used his free will and volition, and he has decided that he will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And unless God would do something, he's totally lost. He's completely lost. What has to take place? The principle of efficacious grace. That is, God the Holy Spirit must make his faith effective for salvation. And under efficacious grace, this then takes place. We must remember that the person who is here, uh, here the unsaved person, is dead. And uh, we must understand that because just as a living person cannot communicate anything to a dead person, it is impossible for a spiritually alive person, a believer, to speak to a spiritually dead person in anything which is meaningful apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. No matter what you do, no matter how clever you are, as a believer, you cannot make the gospel clear enough for an unsaved person to understand it. You cannot do it. That is a miraculous work of God the Holy Spirit when He acts as a human spirit so that He makes the gospel perspicuous into the, in the soul of this person so that they can understand it. Now, uh, once this takes place, uh, under the inviting grace, uh, the, when, when, under, when efficacious grace takes place, and God the Holy Spirit makes the, the uh, volition of the believer effective for salvation, he also, he also gives to this person a new human spirit. The human spirit, then, becomes the target for the imputation of divine righteousness from the source of God the Father. Now God the Father has a target, and he can impute. See, he can't impute. He cannot impute the absolute righteousness to uh, the, the soul. He cannot impute it to the body. He has to impute it to the human spirit. But the, the, uh, and he can only impute plus R to plus R. And so, therefore... Uh, once this person has a human spirit, now there's a target, the human spirit, he imputes absolute righteousness to this uh, human spirit, and now this person becomes trichotomous. He has a body, he has a soul, and he has a human spirit. And this is regeneration. See, he receives a new human spirit and is born again at that point in time. He is born again spiritually. And we have, uh, and I, as I said, as I concluded last time, that there are a number of passages uh, that uh, are in the, uh, will be found in the book that I'm not going to go into with you at this point, but uh, uh, many passages which indicate that uh, faith in Christ by means of grace and grace alone is the only method of salvation. So you have, under the first point, you have pre-salvation grace, and that, is, uh, that involves two things, as we have seen. It involves common grace, and it involves calling grace. Then point two is at the point of salvation grace, and that we have seen is, first of all, efficacious grace, in which God the Holy Spirit makes the gospel effective for salvation. The second gift of grace at the point of salvation 
is the 40 things. That is, God does 40 things for the believer at the point of salvation. And these 40 things have absolutely no feeling attached to them, that they are not an ecstatic, they are unrelated at all to any merit of any kind. The only way you can know about these things is through the Word of God. Now, they are going to be listed for you in the book on grace, and we encourage anyone who'd like to write for the book on grace. It is free of charge, uh, and it will contain all the information that I'm giving uh, in Bible class. But we also have, in a little more detail, published 40 Blessings from Grace. This little booklet is, uh, contains the list of the 40 things that God has provided for the believer at the point of salvation. These 40 things that God does for the believer. Now, I'm just going to quickly list them for you uh, and not go into any great detail because I want to get to the next uh, point, and that is uh, saving grace. Saving grace is the next point that we want to get to. And saving grace begins with logistical grace. The reason I'm anxious to get there is because most people have will go along with you to this point and say, I'm saved by grace. But after that, it's works all the way. So let me just quickly list the 40 things that God does for you. And it begins with efficacious grace. Secondly, it is the sealing of the Holy Spirit. This is the guarantee of eternal salvation. We are given an eternal inheritance uh, that is incorruptible and undefiled, fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Fourthly, regeneration. Fifthly, you are given eternal life. Sixth, you are receive the imputed righteousness which belongs to God. Seven, you are justified. Justified means to be declared righteous in the sight of God. This is not to say that you are declared to be righteous. As far as your experience is concerned, you are declared righteous in the sight of God. It's called justification. Eight is reconciliation. You are reconciled to God by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Because of spiritual death, you are alienated. Now uh, we are reconciled. Uh, propitiation. Propitiation is simply a word that means that God is satisfied with the work of Christ, and having been propitiated, okay, you receive the, the benefit of that. Ten, unlimited atonement. Jesus Christ was judged for all sins, for all men, for all time. Eleven, redemption. Salvation from the slave market of sin. Twelve, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is not uh, a uh, feeling of any kind. It is uh, the work at which God the Holy Spirit places the believer into union with our Lord Jesus Christ. Thirteen, we are become a new spiritual species, something which is unique on the earth. Uh, Fourteen, we enter the royal family of God. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has three, uh, actually, uh, three uh, uh, spheres of royalty. Uh, the first is... Uh, as in the uh, in the Trinity, uh, he has the title Son of God, and his family is God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Secondly, he has the title Son of David, and here the family is uh, David's line or the line of David, the dynasty of David. Uh, thirdly, he ha we, he has battlefield royalty, uh, having won. The, the strategic victory of the cross, his title is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But he has no family. And so God is in the process of building him a royal family, which is the body of Christ, the church. And that's exactly where we are. At the point of salvation, we are adopted uh, uh, into the family as adult sons or adult children in the royal family of God. Fifteen, we have equal privilege and equal opportunity. Sixteen, we have positional sanctification. Sanctification simply means to be set apart for God. And there are four types of sanctification. 
The first is positional sanctification, in which we are positionally set apart for God. Second is experiential sanctification. That is, when we are filled with the Spirit, we are uh, set apart for God experientially. The third is progressive sanctification, in which as we grow in grace, we become more and more set apart for God. And the last is ultimate sanctification, which will take place once we get into eternity future in our resurrection body will be set apart for God forever. Seventeen, we have all the computer assets which are related to our election. Jesus Christ was elected in eternity past, the only one, by the way, and we share his election. The computer assets which are related to our predestination, whom he did foreknow, he did predetermine, or predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. Nineteen, a universal priesthood. Every believer is a priest, and he represents himself to God. Twenty, ambassadorship. Every believer is also a rep an ambassador representing the Lord Jesus Christ to the world. Uh, Twenty-one, uh, the indwelling of God the Father. God the Father indwells every believer for the purpose of uh, uh, guaranteeing the escrow blessing which he has designed in eternity past, uh, because uh, God has provided the portfolio of invisible assets for every believer. 22 is the indwelling of God the Son. The indwelling of God the Son is the one, he's the one who is the depository and the escrow officer, and his indwelling guarantees that when we reach the capacity, we'll receive the escrow blessing that God has for us. And the third of the three is the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. So all three members of the Trinity indwell the believer. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he provides a temple for God the Son, and he provides the power for the believer to live the Christian way of life. 24 uh, is related to this in that it is the unique availability of divine power for every believer. 25, he also has a unique protocol plan for the church age for every believer. 26, the filling or the control of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells every believer, but he fills every believer also until that believer sins. 27, the distribution of spiritual gifts, at least one at the point of salvation. Uh, 28, the believer is uh, uh, not subject to the great white throne judgment. There is uh, therefore now no judgment to those who are in Christ Jesus. 29, we're delivered from the kingdom of Satan. Uh, into the kingdom of his dear son. 30, we are transformed into the kingdom of God. Oh, this, the two, ver two, two things take place in Colossians 1.13b. Uh, 31, we, be, we become a gift from God the Father to God the Son. 32, we are delivered from the power and influence of the old sin nature. As an unbeliever, we had no place, but now he does deliver us. 33, we have unlimited access to God. 34, uh, we have all scar tissue on the soul which has been built up by sin after sin after sin is now removed. 35, we receive the deposit of our escrow blessing in our account in heaven. God deposits this in our escrow account waiting for you. Nobody ever can take it away from you. The only thing is that it will remain forever, and if you don't get it, it will be on... Uh, on display to determine you for your your own determination of the opportunities that you missed. Thirty-six, we are on, on a sure, unmovable foundation. Thirty-seven, we have seven unique relationships with God the Son. Uh, he's the last Adam, and we're the new creation. He's the head, we're the body. He's the great shepherd, we're the sheep. He's the true vine, we're the branches. He's the chief cornerstone, we're the stones in the building. He's the high priest, we're royal priests. He's the groom and we're the bride. 38, we are recipients of eternal security. 39, we have a guarantee of a resurrection body. And 40, we have the beneficiaries of everything we will ever know, need to solve the problems of life, the problem-solving devices. So there are <laughs> the 40 things uh, in, a, in a nutshell. And uh, again, we have the book available if you want to study them, in fact, I've had people write for the book in the quantity to use for Sunday school classes. Uh, these are, it's just an outline form, but the person you could take time by studying the passages of Scripture 
uh, go through it and teach a class on it uh, or a home Bible class or whatever you want to do. Whatever you do with it, it's up to you. Now we come to chapter 4 in our doctrine or in our study, in our book. And that is post-salvation grace. In, his, uh, in the preface to his book, Grace Plus Nothing, Jeff Harkin states this. Oh yes, I became a Christian totally on the basis of God's grace. But I had no knowledge that the Lord intends for me to continue growing in my walk with Him on the basis of grace alone. Jeff Bridges, in his book, Transforming Grace, says in his preface, quote, Even Christian literature available on the subject of grace seems to deal almost exclusively with salvation. But the Bible teaches we are not only saved by grace, but we also live by grace every day of our lives. It is this important aspect of grace that seems to be so little understood or practiced by Christians. It's no surprise because even to the Galatian church, it was a problem. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. This is the first uh, church that Paul founded. You remember the churches of Galatia? And uh, in chapter 3... He looks at these believers and he says in chapter 3, verse 1, You, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I like that word, which is translated uh, bewitched. looks like this in the Greek. B-A-S-K-A-N-I. Zio, and it it means to uh, to uh, confuse, to confound, to uh, uh, do do anything to uh, uh, cover the truth, to take something which should be very very uh, clear and easy and make something out of it. And so he says to these, Christ these people that they are bewitched. Now look at verse 3. Again he calls them foolish. Uh, the word which he uses both in verses 1 and 3 looks like this. Pardon me, left out the word. A-N-O-E-O -E in the Greek. A-noeo. Noeo is the word for mind or to think, ah is the alpha prima negative, which negates, and so is, means without a mind. And he could say mindless or unthinking would be a good translation. Uh, I think he was very gracious saying foolish Galatians. They're stupid Galatians. They were stupid. And why? He says, In, uh, are you so stupid, verse 3, after beginning by means or in the sphere of the Spirit, that saving grace, are you now completed, living grace, by the energy of the flesh? They were having that same problem. Uh, the, along came these false teachers, and the false teachers came along and said, oh yes, you're saved by grace. Then that little three-letter word, but, but, look out for those three-letter words, but, but, you are perfected or you are completed. You become acceptable to God. You become holy. You become uh, whatever by means of your own works, human energy of the flesh. So there is always some kind of a contribution that we make according to this false teaching. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5 for a moment. Get toward the end of the New Testament. You come to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. You're too far. 1 Peter is 
right before John. 1 Peter chapter 5. The Apostle Peter is giving some final words of exhortation. And he says in his final greetings, with the help, uh, verse, verse 12, 2nd, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. In other words, we are to stand fast in the sphere of grace and not uh, be pressured by any teachers or any circumstance or any situation, never not to be confused by false teaching in, uh, or by some kind of legalism which adds human works to it to somehow uh, seek to impress God with our own good works. Scripture has several terms which are, are used to describe people or believers who have failed to execute this. I want you to see a few of them. Uh, since we're here, we may as well look backwards. Uh, just go back to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, uh, we are dealing with a very beautiful subject. In verse 29, he says this, that you can insult the Spirit of grace. It's possible to insult the Spirit of grace. And how did they insult the Spirit of grace? Well by going back to some kind of a temple worship which was based upon human efforts uh, and sacrificing again the Lord Jesus Christ. Now while you're there, look at Hebrews chapter 12. Where he says in verse 15, see to it that no one misses or uh, fails the grace of God and uh, this uh, here is to come short of the grace of God it's possible to come short of the grace of God and uh, it is simply by failing to orient to to God's grace uh, look uh, back to the book of uh, Galatians again Galatians 5, verse 4, where he says, You who are trying to be declared righteous by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. To fall away from grace. Now, this has nothing to do with falling away or losing salvation, but they've fallen away from grace by trying to mix the two. Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. It's called there to nullify the grace of God. And so you have there are at least four statements which indicate the danger of somehow or other going into some kind of a human work. Now Paul describes this period of time in which we live as the dispensation of the grace of God, which means that we are not only saved by grace, beloved, but we live by means of grace. And it's so difficult because everything in life seems to be related to our own efforts. Nothing that we have apart from salvation and all that's related to the Christian way of life, seems to be on the basis of grace. 
You have to work for, you have to earn, you have to deserve. See, one of the great problems with Santa Claus, now you and I know there is no such a character as Santa Claus, but you take Santa Claus, for example, and what, is it, what does it all mean? Uh, Christmas comes along and they sing, you better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. Omniscience. All that, you know. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. And what happens if you're not good? You get a piece of coal. I don't know what they give now, but that's when I was a kid. That's what I was told. You get a piece of coal in your stocking. And so kids try to, sh well, as much as they can, they try to shape up for maybe a few days before Christmas so they can be sure to get those gifts. So they could what? Earn the gift. So they could deserve the gift. You go, I, I know, I used to play Santa Claus. I, I have some natural accoutrements that help me. Uh, Bill Gokinar has some more than I. He, with his beard, he looks like Santa Claus. In fact, he, 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 he looked great last year when he played. But you go to see Santa Claus, and what's the first thing Santa Claus asks the children? Have you been a good little boy or girl? Well, I'm so glad to hear that. And I used to say, liar, because I knew they weren't. There's no kid on the earth has been good. Can't be good. They're liars. And especially the kids who'd come with a list that's so long for, what do you want for Christmas from, what do you want Santa to bring you? A long list of things. I'd say, grubby little selfish beast. You know, but I, I should have learned I wasn't there to teach him, you know. But anyway, well, if you could only, you, Santa certainly can't bring you all that stuff. I'll find something that you like to bring. Well, of course, I promise him those things. But the idea is this. If you're good, you can have this. If you're good, you can get that. If you, if you can work for or deserve this or that, you can have it, you see. Uh, beloved, the Christian way of life is a super human way of life. And there is absolutely no way that any member of the human race Anybody who's a human being could possibly live the kind of life that God demands unless God would provide the ability. And the wonderful news is that He does. But it's not on the basis of merit. It is not because you earn it. It's not because you're little Mr. Goody Two-Shoes and you deserve it because you've been good enough. It is made available by grace and grace alone. And grace is unmerited favor. That's why when you do succeed in living the superhuman way of life, you can say with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15:10. I am what I am by the grace of God. God has done so many things for us. But here is the key. Stop and think for just a moment. I have been criticized for my book on prayer. Because I seem to say that we don't need to pray as much as everybody seems to think. Now stop here for a moment. Grace is God's divine policy that depends on God's wisdom. Therefore, in God's wisdom, does he or does he not know what is best for us. If you tell me that God's wisdom doesn't know what's best for us, then you don't know God. God's wisdom knows what's best for the believer. 
even more than what? Our own desires. Beloved, you don't know what's good for you. And so many times when you go to God in prayer, you're asking for something that you, in your human wisdom, think is good for you. And I'm here to tell you, you don't know what's good for you. But God does, and if you're smart, you'll leave the choice with Him. And stop this running to God all the time, telling God what to do in your life, because that's what you think is what's good for you. You don't tell God what's good for you, because you don't know what's good for you. You're not smart enough to know what's good for you. You don't have omniscience. And it's amazing. People think they know what's good for them. But grace gives us what God wants for us. And God will always provide what's best for us. I was listening the other day to Johnny Erickson Tata who was a quadriplegic, and she was celebrating an anniversary, the anniversary of the day that she dove off of a raft in a lake and broke her neck, and from that day to this has been able to, unable to move the rest of her body except her head. She even paints with a brush in her teeth. Beautiful job. And she had the nerve to say that's the best thing that ever happened to her. Now, let me ask you something. What person in his right mind is going to pray, God, make me a paraplegic? Nobody! You wouldn't pray for that in a million years. But if the grace of God provides that for you, mark it down. That's the best thing for you in life. You can be sure, you can relax, that whatever God wants for you or for me is the very best possible, and it's far greater than anything you could desire for yourself. In fact, he tells us that it's far better than we could ask or even imagine when He provides for us the life beyond dreams. Therefore, I say, the mature believer doesn't spend a lot of time in prayer telling God what He wants to do. We prayed for Cheryl. We didn't pray that God would get her out of the hospital by Monday night. God did it. That was best for her. Why, we thought she'd still be in the hospital. Here she's at Bible class tonight less than a week after major surgery. We didn't pray for that. I mean, we don't know, but we, just, we prayed that for the, the wisdom, for the physicians and surgeons, for those who are working with her, prayed for strength, and, and God just took it over, you know, and he did, he did above all that we could ask or think. Far beyond that. Isn't it better to leave those things entirely with God and make prayer a time of fellowship with God? Fellowship with the Heavenly Father. Just enjoying Him. Praying back to Him passages of Scripture that you have learned about Him. Praising Him. Thanking Him. Thinking about some of His characteristics. Instead of this constantly going before Him telling him what you think is best for you. You know, beloved, it's just a good thing that he doesn't give us all that we think is good for us. It's just great that he doesn't do that. But he does give us what is good for us. How thrilling it is for the believer to leave it in the hands of the God who loves him. And that's one of the things I we're concerned about teaching our young people, our boys and girls. That God knows what's best. 
There used to be old chorus, God's way is the best way, God's way is the right way. By trusting in Jesus, he, he carries us through. All right, so let's understand that when we're talking about living grace, we're talking about that which is unearned and undeserved to make it possible for us to live day by day in the hostile environment of the devil's world and to live this life to the maximum. Now, you will never earn or deserve one of the things that he does for you. And so under living grace, we have three categories. The first category is logistical grace. The second is disciplining grace. None of us likes that. None of us likes to be spanked by God, but He spanks us all, not by turning us over His knee. Many different ways He spanks us. We'll discuss that. But there is also super or multiplied grace. When God multiplies His grace to the believer. Three phases of grace. We're starting off now with the doctrine of logistical grace located under living grace. And we begin with a definition. This is an interesting word, logistics. It really comes from the military. It's a military term. It refers to the science of let's see in there. Supply, provision, and planning which is related to troop movements. On uh, VE Day, that was victory in Europe during World War II, WW2, the, here's England, here's France, the, the Allies tried to convince the Germans that they were going to land the landing party on the soil of France over here, whereas actually the plan was to land over, land over here. This was farther away, but it was also farther away from the strong German entrenchments. And this is what they did. They did exactly that. And the idea was to send the three different groups under, uh, 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 this was Patton, this was uh, uh, Montgomery, uh, to send them up through France. And uh, uh, the problem with this, of course, is very simple. If you're going to send a tank corps, uh, tanks run on gasoline. So you've got to also provide gasoline. Uh, they are shooting bullets. You've got to, therefore, provide the ammunition. Uh, you're, you're going to have to provide also food for this group. Uh, you're going to have to provide medical care for the wounded. All of these things. Well, what happened was Patton moved so fast that the supply lines couldn't keep up with him. That he had to finally just stop here and wait for the supplies to catch up with them. He, he surprised them all. The cavalry, not Calvary, people mispronounce it on the air all the time. The cavalry, we used to be horse uh, troops. Cavalry became the tank, the tanks became the cavalry. And the cavalry moved so fast that the hay couldn't catch up with them. And so they used to, they'd steal it from the Germans, they'd do what they could, but there were other things that they couldn't get from the Germans. And so they just had to stop dead in their tracks and wait. In fact, when he was up there, he wanted to go over and help Montgomery, but of course Montgomery was so arrogant, he wouldn't hear of it. Uh, and uh, so he didn't uh, do it. But the point is, uh, it, it, it involves everything regarding movement and maintenance 
of all the resources and services necessary to sustain a military force. Included in the definition would be the handling and implementation of personnel under every condition. Logistics include the design, the development, acquisition, storage, movement, distribution, maintenance, evacuation, and disposal of material. Think of all those things. I mean, you can't do everything. It's all a part of it. It even includes maintenance of housing facilities and hospitalization. So the, 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 the definition of logistics, then, is the technical term for sustaining and supporting troops in every form of military activity. And from the military and nomenclature comes the Bible analogy. This is the divine, and the logistical grace is the divine planning, the divine support, the divine provision, and divine blessing for the execution of the plan of God by means of God's royal family here on the earth to fulfill His will, His purpose, His design for that royal family. And it includes three basic factors of provision. Would you believe with a few minutes to go we run out of tried to be economical but I couldn't do it. Three things, three factors are included in God's divine provision. One, God grace does everything to keep you alive in the devil's world. It's called life support. Now, beloved, this means that God is responsible to provide for you food, clothing, a job, housing, transportation. I mean, he is responsible to see that all of these things are provided for you. Now, as soon as we say that, somebody says, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, let me tell you something. God didn't do a single thing for me. I, I did it all. Mm hmm I did it all. And if I didn't do it, it wouldn't get done. But that's not what God says at all. I thought I had this marked here, the passage that I wanted. But it's, uh, I, I have three different Bibles, and I use different Bible at different times. But here it, here it is. Woe to you who say, it is by my hand that I have done this or that or anything. It is by my strength that I have accomplished this or that or anything. It is because of the Lord's provision that you have the strength to do anything. Remember, it is God's grace that gives you the strength. If you are able to do a job, then it's because God's grace has given you the job to have. God's grace has given you the strength to do the job. It's because of who and what God is that all of these things take place, and not because of yourself. 
someone said, well, I've, I've lost my job. What do I do? Well, many times, and we fail to realize this, when God takes a job away, it's His way of redirecting you to something else He wants you to do. Some other thing that He has for you. And the, the wonderful thing about this living grace, uh, the logistical grace here for life support, is this. That God doesn't always provide only for our needs. He provides also for our greeds. You have a lot more than you need. All of us have a lot more than we need. All I have to do is look down and say, I know I have a lot more than I need. And most of us are like that. Maybe not as severe as I, but... And we all can look somewhere around us. We have more than we need. We have, we have a lot of our greeds which have been provided for us by the grace of our God. The second area, and we have to, I just want to give you these three and we're finished for this class. The second that he, thing he provides for us is blessing. Now, blessing is that which will make you happy. It's happinesses and here's the thing that we fail to understand that the blessing of the life that the, the provision of life support or the, the provision of blessing is for the good and the bad believers for the winner for the loser for the carnal for the spiritual for the one in fellowship for the one out of fellowship for the obedient and for the disobedient and on and on in other words it is not just something that is provided for the good guys, for the spiritual guys, for the ones who are growing in grace. It's provided for all believers. And you see, David couldn't understand it. He said, why do the wicked prosper? Lord, I deserve more than him. After all, look at what I've done. But you see, you'll never understand that. We'll deal with this more later on. But the point is this. One reason people don't understand suffering is because they fail to understand logistical grace, that God's grace is for everyone. Well, the third area is the divine provision for every believer to execute the plan of God. And we'll look at this, what God has given to you by means of grace so that you can grow up spiritually. And this is so important. Everything that we have as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is provided on the basis of who and what God is and not on the basis of what we have done or what we can do or what we have earned or deserved. It is always difficult for us to understand this because somehow or other we have the thinking that we deserve something from God because of what we've done for Him. After all I've given, after all of my service, after all of my whatever, fill in the blanks. God, don't you owe me something more? Beloved, God doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe me anything, and He never will. He never will. We receive everything we have by the grace of God. Not have I gotten, but what I receive. Grace hath bestowed it since I have believed. Never forget that. That's the theme of our song. Now, thank you, Father, for our study. May God, the Holy Spirit, help us to begin to grasp the truth about what grace is all about. In Jesus' name, amen.